Hello, my name is Sam Ord, and this is the last in the lecture series on ultrasound physics. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about bioeffects and safety. So during this lecture, we are going to discuss about the sort of ultrasound or acoustic output quantities in terms of pressure, power, and intensity. We will talk, be talking about how to describe the intensity parameters both in spatial and temporal means. We'll discuss the potential bioeffects or the uh, potentially adverse effects that ultrasound can have on tissues both in terms of thermal and mechanical bioeffects. And finally, we'll talk briefly about the appropriate use criteria and the ALARA principle, which is as low as reasonably achievable. Uh, and that's about trying to limit the use of ultrasound just when it's needed. So ultrasound interacts with tissues. And we've talked about before in some of the other lectures about how we uh, get attenuation of that ultrasound as it goes through the tissues. And that leads to deeper structures uh, having less echogenicity than superficial structures. Um, this attenuation is caused because of the transfer of the energy of the sound wave into heat energy. Um, and obviously, as energy cannot be created or destroyed, uh, that means the energy can, that you lose through attenuation it gets transferred into heat. And that's where you get these thermal and mechanical effects that we'll discuss a little bit later. So the theory is, is that ultrasound can actually cause damage through, this, uh, through both of this, this pressure change into heat change. And we know this from stuff like lithotripsy. You know, we use ultrasound to break down renal and gallstones. So I think we can show pretty obviously that ultrasound in sufficiently high intensities can cause damage. So in that regard, we've got to try and think about it with diagnostic ultrasound, that there is the potential, albeit really tiny that you know with the uh, uh, diagnostic intensities they have the potential to cause harm I think the important thing to try and remember with all of this is one of these statements that comes out from all of the ultrasound um, you know all the ultrasound bodies around the world they have a statement like this that's in, contained within their structure somewhere so what they've said is that diagnostic ultrasound has been widely used in clinical medicine for many years with no proven deleterious effects but again, as I said, there is an argument that could be said that based on how we are analyzing things at the moment, we have not been able to pick up any problems with, uh, with ultrasound at its diagnostic intensities ever. However, maybe that's a problem to do with the way we're looking at it, or we're looking at we haven't looked at it for long enough. Ultrasound's only been around, what, 30, 35, 40 years? So we have to consider that there is a chance for harm, and in that regard, we have to look at and trying to understand it as best we can, where it comes from, and trying to mitigate the risks of uh, harm. And that's where the ALARA principle comes in, the as low as reasonably achievable. So the, uh, it, it's the ultrasound output quantities that are going to be related to the bioeffects that we're talking about. And so we've got to consider these, these ultrasound parameters to describe the energy. And there are different ways of quantifying how much energy goes into the body with ultrasound. So first of all, we'll know that energy is, a, use an example, is for the total work done. The acoustic pressure, well this is the compression of the sound wave. That leads to power, which is I guess the energy per second that is transferred, and intensity. Probably the most useful parameter uh, that we've got because, uh, uh, and that's the power per unit area. So power is the energy per second, intensity is the power per unit area. So we're getting an idea of both the, uh, sort of the power for a given volume of tissue as well as uh, sort of that transfer per second. So the acoustic pressure, that's the strength of the wave. We typically measure that in pascals. Uh, in diagnostic ultrasound, it's about you know, less than four megapascals. And that's happening with the, uh, you know, on this graph here, you've seen a, a lot of times before, you know, it's this peak positive pressure, which is coming through compression of the sound wave molecules, as opposed to when you're getting rarefraction, when those molecules are separating, or those particles are separating, and that's giving you the negative pressure. And this is important to consider when we're talking about the mechanical effects of the tissue, which we'll talk about in a moment. We can measure this acoustic pressure using a hydrophone. So this is a, a, another piezoelectric uh, crystal device, but it only listens. It doesn't transmit the ultrasound. And so we can put this in a, in a 
bath and if you have the transducer there, you can try and determine what the change in pressure or the acoustic pressure is of a transducer. The power is the total energy delivered to the body each second, as we discussed. Um, and so we can look at this rate of energy transmission into the tissue. We can measure this in milliwatts. And the typical value for ultrasound is probably approximately uh, uh, 10 milliwatts. We can measure these of the transducers using, again, a very sensitive sort of balance, analytical balance, uh, typically in a bath of water again. And it's essentially like the scales that you use in your kitchen, but about uh, in, you know, a million times more sensitive. And that ultrasound is going to exert a certain force on the balance, which will get picked up as long as uh, that balance is sensitive enough. So as the beam power increases, we know that the intensity is going to increase as well. And that's because intensity is, uh, is power per unit area. So essentially, if we're increasing the beam area, if we're decreasing the beam area with something like focusing, that's going to increase the intensity. I like to try and consider that or try and imagine it a bit like uh, uh, you know, a, um, a magnifying glass. If you've got a magnifying glass, if you put that down onto a piece of paper, focus it down onto a piece of paper, it intensifies that the sun's rays and you can cause, uh, you know, you can cause a piece of paper to set on fire with a magnifying glass. The advantages of using intensity as a description of uh, the ultrasound wave is it has both spatial and temporal considerations. So in terms of the spatial considerations, this is how the intensity is going to vary across uh, the beam. And temporal uh, considerations is how it's going to vary in time. So that's particularly important with things like pulsed ultrasound, of course. And the, the last thing to consider about intensity is in terms of the amplitude. And we've got to remember that intensity is proportional to amplitude squared. So if we double the amplitude, we are going to quadruple the intensity. So let's consider about intensity the spatial considerations first of all. So using these two graphs, uh, it tries to describe that on the left, it's sort of the beam intensity profile in three dimensions to try and show that you're going to be getting the increase, the highest intensity in that central portion of the wave. And if we're using that in cross-section analysis, so uh, up in the graph on the, on the right there, we've got the distance across the beam on the x-axis and the intensity in terms of watts per centimeter squared on the left side. We can see that in the center of that beam, that's where you're going to have the highest intensity, uh, and it's going to fall off at the peripheries. So there are two values, SP, spatial peak, and SA, which is spatial average. So spatial average is the average intensity across the entire cross-section. So it's at a specific depth, obviously, and the value is going to be lower than the spatial peak, which is the point of greatest intensity, and typically it's at the central axis or at that point of focus. Okay? So now the temporal considerations is how this varies with time. So again, remembering for, for B-mode imaging, M-mode imaging, and pulse wave Doppler, we are sending out a pulse of ultrasound and then we listen. And the amount of time that we spend listening compared to the actual pulse is uh, much, much greater. And this is where the duty factor comes in. So again, the pulse duration is dependent on depth of your imaging, and, or pulse repetition frequency is dependent on depth of your imaging, the frequency, as we've discussed in other lectures. The duty factor is that percentage of time that the ultrasound wave is on compared to its actually listening. So for B-mode imaging, it's somewhere between 0.01 to 0.1%. For pulse wave Doppler, 0.5 to 5% maybe. So we can now consider in terms of temporal uh, considerations with intensity, how that can vary either across the pulse, the intensity just with the pulse, or we consider about how it would vary based on the duty factor. So maybe we should say that if we're looking at the intensity during the pulse, for example, that will be approximately, like for B-mode imaging, approximately 100 to 1,000 times higher than if we average it across the whole thing because the duty factor is 0.1%, for example. So this is where you get an idea that if you're just looking at the peak, the temporal peak, that value will be much higher than if we're looking at the average. And that's based, again, as I said, on, this, uh, on the duty factor. B-mode, it's about yeah, 0.1 to 1% and higher for pulse wave Doppler. 
So the temporal average is that intensity averaged over time, not just for the actual pulse. So it's including both transmission and reception, and we've typically got low values uh, because that duty factor for B mode imaging, you know, about 0.1, uh, maybe as low as 0.01, maybe as high as 1%. The pulse average, so again, you're just looking at a particular pulse. And that means you're gonna, you can have the pulse average or the temporal peak. So the, the pulse average is just the average intensity over that pulse duration only. So it's going to be higher than that temporal average by a value of 100 to 1,000 times higher. The temporal peak is the single value which you're going to reach to that peak. So it's not talking about an average over uh, reception and transmission of the sound wave. It's just looking at that highest value, so the temporal peak. So let's put it all together. So you can have SATA. That you can have SATA, SBTA, SPPA, or SPTP. Highly confusing. Try and obviously have it out. So you can have spatial average, temporal average, or you can have spatial peak, temporal average, spatial peak, pulse average, or spatial peak, temporal peak. Let's go through each of these in turn. So first of all, SATA. So this is spatial average, time average. So that means that we're going to average the intensity over time as well as over the entire transducer surface. So this is going to be the lowest value that we can describe, okay? because we're obviously averaging it both over distance across the beam as well as through the entire pulse, uh, pulse length, both the transmission and the reception. Uh, Sparta, which just looks at the spatial peak. So again, we're not worried about any kind of distance across it. We're just looking at the focus area and the maximum intensity in terms of the space at so that focal point. And we can average it across the, both the reception and the transmission. So this is the most commonly presented uh, intensity value that's mainly described. And it's really useful in describing thermal dynamics, which we're going to discuss in a minute. SPPA, spatial peak pulse average intensity. So this is going to be that highest intensity across that beam. And we're going to be averaging it over the, the time that that ultrasound is being emitted or transmitted. Okay, and this is particularly important when we're dealing with cavitation or a mechanical bioeffects. Uh, sorry, the, the mechanical bioeffects that we'll go on to discuss. Finally, let's talk about SPTP. So this is the highest intensity value we can describe. It's giving you both the highest intensity, both in spatial uh, spatial uh, resolution in terms of distance across the beam, so it's highest intensity at the focus point, as well as the highest focus point, as well as the highest intensity across that pulse as well. So it's the highest intensity value we can describe. Okay. So let me ask you a question. So which of the following intensity values has the lowest value for B-mode imaging? Spatial peak, temporal peak, spatial average, temporal average, spatial peak, uh, pulse average, or they're all the same? So I hope you're going to be able to tell me that the SATA, the spatial average, temporal average, is going to be the lowest value that we're going to be to describe in terms of intensities. And that's because we're averaging the intensity both across the distance across the beam, as well as the difference across both uh, transmission and reception of those sound waves. So let's move on to talk about bioeffects. So we said that there are two main types of bioeffects. You've got thermal effects within the way that that pressure is transferred into heat energy as part of the sort of the attenuation and as well as uh, mechanical uh, bioeffects. And so this is the way that ultrasound can cause the cells to move. And that's because of mainly you're getting that pressure change that's happening with the compression and rarefaction, and that can cause movement of cells. So these are both bioeffects, which is the physical or mechanical change that ultrasound can cause to tissues. We'll start off with thermal bioeffects. So We've said that heat can cause damage, and I think this is a particular relevance to fetal tissues. So we've got a sign here on the right just to try and remember, or an image on the right, and this is my uh, third son. Uh, this is my third child, my son. I've got a daughter and two sons. Uh, and this is him at eight, uh, eight weeks gestation, and he's about the size of a bean. And I I'm using this to try and highlight the example that ultrasound can particularly cause damage to, 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 to kids when they're at this size. So you do not want to be putting your highest, intensity, uh, your highest intensity form of ultrasounds, like pulse wave Doppler, you do not want to be putting pulse wave Doppler over this little guy's heart for minutes on end, because you will cause, that's what gives you the highest intensity pulse wave ultrasound in a particular area, and that can cause heating. So again, then we're going to be talking about the Alara principle, as low as reasonably achievable. If you're going to image, uh, if you're going to be imaging um, 
fetuses or you're going to be imaging anyone at all. You need to be doing it as quickly as possible for, uh, with the lowest power uh, as you can. Okay? So the ultrasound intensity is obviously the, the, major, the major thing we're going to be looking at. It's, it's going to depend on the location uh, as much as anything else. So that this is where we can get different kinds of description of thermal bioeffects about whether we're imaging soft tissue or bone. Okay? It's all through heat production, as we said, there's through attenuation. And in this regard, perfusion does come into it. If you've got a highly vascular structure, which, is, um, uh, which has got a lot of blood flow, then the heat that you generate will be taken away faster. And that's as opposed to something that doesn't have as high a blood flow, that's maybe got a higher density, which will absorb heat better, and it will stay in that area. So something like bone, for example. Okay? We must remember that the rate of absorption is going to be dependent on frequency. The higher the frequency, the greater the absorption. And that should hopefully be well known to you in terms of uh, resolution, in terms of we reduce our, uh, reduce our frequency to have better penetration. And uh, we talked about uh, the location. That's dependent on the tissue type. So a fibrous tissue is going to absorb, uh, absorb heat better than a kidney, for example. Okay. Uh, and finally, as we discussed, it's the duration of imaging that you, if you're doing B mode, you're going to have uh, much less heat generation with B mode of a certain area of tissue, like my son's heart, for example, than if you put pulse wave Doppler over it and leave it there for five minutes, which would cause significant damage uh, through heat generation, for example. So what's the limit? Well, the limit is typically described as below about 1.5 to 2 degrees. So it's been shown in animal studies that there is, be, there is no bio effects below 1.5 degrees. Above 1.5 degrees, it's going to depend on a multitude of factors, both time that you spend there, so how much exposure you're giving, is it B-mode imaging, pulse wave Doppler, the vascular, light, uh, the vascular uh, nature of the structure, for example. It depends on what your starting temperature is at. You know, if we were starting, uh, typically if we're going at 1.5 degrees, that's above normothermia. If you start if, uh, at a pyrexial level, then maybe we can uh, induce bioeffects a bit earlier than that. So there's obviously a considerable number of uh, assumptions that the machine has to make to give you a thermal index. And this thermal index is this sort of estimated acoustic power which is required to raise the temperature by one degree. So this is what is going to be displayed on your machine. It's what's going to come up and it's what you've got to keep an eye on so that you can make sure that you avoid bioeffects. You know, that it's calculating based on the probe that you're using, the power that you're using, frequency, depth, scanning mode, et cetera, et cetera. And all these assumptions are coming into it. And depending on what type of imaging that you're doing, and again, that's going to be uh, on your scan settings that you're talking about, whether you're doing, with, let's take, we'll use fetus as an example, whether you're doing soft tissue imaging for the fetus or you're looking at, uh, looking at their bone, looking at their femur, or whether you're doing cranial imaging. Um, it's going to show you a different uh, sort of thermal index score for each of those. With ECHO, we're typically looking at TIS, so obviously we're looking at soft tissue. And some machines aren't going to show you this uh, thermal index unless you're getting above one, so you're getting into danger territories, but some will show it all the time. But again, the number that you're looking for is, is, is typically sort of greater than, than 1.5. So now we'll discuss mechanical bioeffects. And this is, the, uh, this is the assumption that obviously with ultrasound waves, we're getting changes in pressure. Those changes in pressure can have effect on tissues. So when a force uh, reflects or absorbs ultrasound, you can have what's known as a radiation force. And this can lead to movement of structures or, uh, or acoustic streaming, it's known as. Uh, and this is absolutely harmless at diagnostic intensities through, through our examination on animal studies. But it is possible. We know that with certain intensities, we can cause fluid to move with ultrasound. The one, bio the one mechanical bioeffect that is extremely important to understand and is going to be um, presented on the display of your ultrasound machine as MI, or the mechanical index, is uh, using this to try and describe this process of cavitation. So this is an important one to understand. And cavitation is with this concept that through this production of pressure, we can cause bubbles to form, or we can cause uh, effects to happen on bubbles, or we can cause them to collapse if we reach a certain threshold of pressure. And with this collapse of a bubble, you can generate heat and pressure. This cavitation is related to uh, spatial peak temp uh, pulse average, sorry, SPPA, spatial peak pulse average. So it's quite a high intensity. And we use this to describe 
uh, the, uh, the risk of causing cavitation. There are two types of cavitation. We've got stable cavitation or non-inertial non cavitation, or you've got uh, transient uh, or inertial cavitation, which is the more serious one. Stable cavitation is where the bubbles do not collapse. We can maybe cause a bit of acoustic streaming happening. It's not serious. Transient cavitation has been shown in animal studies to be dangerous, and in particular in relation to thoracic imaging, where with high enough intensities you can cause potentially uh, microvasculature uh, bleeding in the lungs with ultrasound intensities. Again, not at diagnostic intensities, but it has been proven at higher than diagnostic intensities in animal subjects. What essentially is happening with a certain degree of intensity, you can call, cause bubbles to form, grow rapidly, and then collapse. And they, there is a, a, tr a threshold of pressure that you have to get to, to to make this happen. But when they do collapse, they can cause large amounts of heat and pressure to be released, and that can cause damage and the bleeding in the lungs in these animal subjects that it was shown. We describe this, uh, or so the, the approximation of the risk of the mechanical bioeffects is known as the mechanical index. So this is the threshold for the bioeffects, and the magic number to try and remember is 1.9. Okay, uh, and uh, this gives you sort of a, an, an idea of the, the risk of bioeffects once that threshold has been reached. Okay. So both the thermal index and the mechanical index are sort of standard on output displays. I think it's important to know that they frequently overestimate the risk of bioeffects, but they're all displayed for the reason that ultrasound, in theory, can cause damage. So we need to try and make sure that we keep our thermal index less than 1.5, mechanical index less than 1.9 or 2, and it is going to be displayed. It's, it's vendor, uh, uh, vendor um, non-specific. It's going to be shown on all of your machines with any probe. And there's a kind of sort of standard standard output displays which are decided by bodies like you know the Australian Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine or the FDA and things like that. And that's where documents such as this have come out, which was what's known as appropriate use criteria. So as we've said, the risk of ultrasound are low. There have been human epidemiological studies which show there are no adverse events from diagnostic ultrasound. Um, but it is possible. We've shown this ultrasound damage has been shown in like cell, plant, and animal studies, particularly when we're getting higher intensities than we're using in diagnostic ultrasound. And so uh, the bodies like the American Society of Echo bodies here brought out in 2011 this appropriate use criteria, trying to make sure that we are following the ALARA principle, which is as low as reasonably achievable. So the ALARA principle says that we have to weigh up the risk and benefit analysis. We have to try and keep the exposure time to a minimum and use the lowest possible power that we can. We don't want to keep our probe in the same place for a long period of time, and that is specifically important when we're dealing with things like fetal pulse wave Doppler. So I think in summary, we, we know that there are safety issues that we have to consider with ultrasound. And we will try and describe those based specifically on things like power and intensity and uh, a way to describe acoustic pressure. The intensity parameters that we are used to describe, uh, sort of universally used, include both spatial and temporal parameters to describe the intensity. And that's used to talk about thermal and mechanical bioeffects. And that's why on the machines we have the thermal index and the mechanical index. And we must sure that we make sure that we keep our thermal index less than about 1.5. And we make sure we keep our mechanical index less than 1.9. And machines will come up with big warnings when you start to get above these levels. We must follow appropriate use criteria. Doing unnecessary ultrasounds, it, it can, in theory, be able to cause damage. I think training is essential, and you have to have a hands-on component to training. So I would put training as part of the appropriate use criteria, as long as it is not done uh, extensively, for long periods of time with the probe in the same position, and we avoid uh, using pulse wave Doppler on uh, you know, fetal hearts, for example, like that. And it's all about trying to make sure in your practice that you follow the ALARA principle, which is as low as reasonably achievable.
Okay? But let's not forget that diagnostic ultrasound has been widely used in clinical medicine for many years with no proven deleterious effects. Ultrasound has never been shown to cause any problems at diagnostic intensities. In my view, it is an extremely safe, versatile, very useful tool to use in the critical care setting. But I think it is important to know that there are safety issues there. Once again, these are the references that I've used. I think they're important. I encourage you to look at them, uh, particularly the first two. Um, I really hope these lecture series has been useful for you. Uh, I look forward to hearing some feedback from you. Thank you very, very much for your time.